Today's Formula One stars were all born to race, but without careful nurturing from a young age, their raw speed and ability would have remained nothing but potential. Q. Gwen Legru, the F1 talent guru responsible for polishing these hidden gems into refined jewels. Take a bow, George Russell, finally a Grand Prix winner and the 113th driver to do so. This is just the beginning. And Esteban Ocon wins the Hungarian Grand Prix for his first ever win in Formula One. Yeah! Grand Prix winners George Russell and Esteban Ocon both have Gwen Legru to thank for their place on the F1 grid. And as the man in charge of the Mercedes Young Driver program, Gwen scouts talented racers, recruits them, takes them under his wing and fine tunes them until they shine at the pinnacle of motorsport. We meet very rarely the one who will become world champion. That I think happens uh, every 10, 12 years, eventually. But I don't think the last 15 years we missed uh, someone exceptional. I think all the exceptional drivers are actually in Formula One. Hello and welcome to F1 Beyond the Grid with me, Tom Clarkson. Gwen Legru grew up wanting to be a racer, but after 13 years in karting and rally, he realised his career was better devoted to helping others achieve their motorsport dreams. That path has taken the Frenchman to Mercedes, where he's in charge of the team's Young Driver program. Focusing his search for the next F1 stars in karting, he watched the likes of George Russell, Max Verstappen, Charles Leclerc, Alex Albon and Esteban Ocon, all competing for titles across Europe in their adolescent years. Russell, Ocon and Albon became Gwen's protégés and he's facilitated their transformation into world-class Formula One drivers today. He clearly knows talent when he sees it. Now Legru is looking for the next generation of F1 superstars. He tells me what qualities he wants to see in a young driver and why speed isn't the only attribute that counts. He talks about how often he encounters a potential world champion, what challenges F1 rookies face today, some of the youngsters currently on his books that we should look out for, and much, much more. And we have another treat for you at the end of our chat, because I also gauge the thoughts of Mercedes team principal Toto Wolff on their recruitment of young drivers and whether Verstappen could have joined the three-pointed star earlier in his career. It's all a really fascinating insight into how F1 stars are discovered. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Gwen, before we get on to the current crop of young drivers for Mercedes, how many on the current Formula One grid have been through the Gwen Legru boot camp, if you like? So I had the, the privilege to, to work with uh, Esteban Ocon, uh, George Russell and um, Alex Albon. Well, can we talk about each of those guys? Why not start with George Russell? When did he first come onto your radar? The first time I met George was in a PFI, uh, International Go-Kart Track. Uh, it was uh, in 2010, if uh, I remember right. And it was for a, a European uh, event, a European Go-Kart event. And um, that's when we really... I knew him before because I was uh, following the Go-Kart season. But that's the first time we properly met uh, and start to discuss and have a proper discussion about uh, what he was doing, uh, who is he, etc, etc. So, and I quite like the first discussion we had. And what impressed you about him in terms of what he was doing on track? He was uh, extremely confident in himself and uh, I think that didn't change really. <laughs> he was um, extremely determined, but you could feel already at that time he was uh, different. There's a great story that he approached Toto Wolff at an award ceremony, but this was before all that. I think it was probably about the same period of time, but at that time I was working uh, at Lotus F1 team. I think he approached Toto a little bit later than this. We have to ask him. I don't remember. <laughs> so you were actually thinking of him as a Lotus young driver back then, not a Mercedes driver? 
Yeah, absolutely. I had the, the, the privilege to witness a fantastic uh, generation at that time because every weekend I was uh, watching Max Verstappen, Charles Leclerc, uh, Pierre Gasly, George Russell, Esteban Ocon. They were all racing together. It was an absolutely uh, unique period of time uh, in go-kart. Such a generation fighting in front of me. Anyone could... Uh, pick uh, a young superstar at that time <laughs> and then of course george wins the brazilian grand prix last year uh, we'll come on to how you help young drivers in a minute but how did you feel after he won in brazil well of course it's always uh, a special moment and uh, uh, when he won the last laps i was just remembering the difficult times uh, we had to face uh, in f2 and uh, also at williams during uh, three years and uh, see him winning uh, is uh, the reason why I'm here uh, with the team and why I'm helping drivers. That's the first step of uh, a concrete achievement uh, in Formula One. And uh, I hope he will have many more. And of course, the next step will be to win a, a championship. And you felt like you were a, a small cog in the wheel that created the George Russell we know today. I think I was just uh, one part of the system. You know, we are a number of people around uh, the drivers to, to, to deliver a job, and I'm just uh, one part of the chain. It's a teamwork, technically, teamwork. So you have Alesh, his coach, uh, Harry and Gary, who are uh, supporting and helping him since uh, day one. Also, uh, me, uh, well, Toto, and the entire team. You say that you've worked with Ocon as well. When did you first meet Esteban? And did you see the same qualities in him that you saw in George? So Esteban was actually the first uh, I signed and picked in go-kart. And that was uh, end of 2009. Each of them are completely different. And that's why it requires a specific way of work with each of them. Uh, it's a handmade work. And Esteban was um, very mature for his age. He was also, I think, 12 or 11 years old when I uh, met him first time. And you can see he was, uh, his hunger to drive, to, to win. Uh, he was uh, uh, also very uh, apart, very determined as well. Obviously, he was coming from uh, an environment. Uh, they had absolutely no money to race. Uh, he was racing with... Uh, used and dead tires and <laughs> stuff like this and he was still doing a, a really good job so when we met uh, our help was uh, crucial because without our support and our financial backing he was uh, about to stop his go-kart career and how does it feel now that Esteban is racing for a rival? Well, he's still uh, under a management contract, so we are still managing his career. And uh, we have agreed with uh, Alpine uh, to lend him. So we are still very connected to uh, Esteban. So we are still uh, following everything and helping and supporting uh, him, even though if he's racing uh, for a competitor. But uh, he's still, in a way, part of the family. And I guess there's nothing quite like your first child, right? So if Esteban was number one, how did you feel when he won in Hungary a couple of years ago? Well, it, about the same, I have to say. It's, uh, it's, for me, it's more, uh, I, I'm more uh, depressed uh, when we lose or when we have bad times uh, than when we win. We, we are doing all that at the end of the day to win. So winning is just... Uh, a normal achievement, I would say, but when we lose a championship uh, in a junior series or when we lose a, a good opportunity, I'm more uh, affected uh, than uh, happy when we're winning because that's what we have to do. Now, it might come as a surprise that you work with Alex Albon because so many people associate his junior career with Red Bull. Yeah, well, actually, Alex was also uh, racing with this uh, absolutely famous generation of uh, young drivers with Max, etc. And he was really, really good. He won European and World Championship uh, at that time. And uh, in end of 2012, the young driver program he was with <laughs> has decided to stop uh, their collaboration. So I signed him at Lotus because I knew him since the go-kart. And actually, we have, uh, I have helped him and I have supported him uh, 
till uh, he signed again with the same young driver program <laughs> who decided to stop uh, their uh, journey at that time. So yeah, I know him really well and we did uh, Formula Renault, uh, F3, uh, GP3 and F2 with uh, Alex, yeah. And I was really helping him as a friend and, uh, and uh, without any uh, interest because uh, with a total support and agreement of uh, Toto and Mercedes. He did also some simulator for us at Mercedes and we also released him to make him sign uh, when he had the opportunity. So those are the current guys you're working with. Now, how often do drivers of Formula One caliber come along? <laughs> it is a good question. Uh, I think we meet very rarely the one who will become world champion. That I think happen uh, every 10, 12 years eventually. But drivers able to come in Formula One, I think, uh, I believe in each uh, driver I have, and when I sign them uh, in go kart, uh, I believe we will uh, make it happen. So, and and we, you need to believe about what you are doing, and the target is to bring them in Formula One. And if you are not able to reach this uh, target, I will do everything I can to help this driver to become professional. But we we know, of course. Uh, you cannot bring them all to Formula One, but uh, it has to be a target. And if we are not able to achieve that target, I know that they will become professional anyway, in endurance, in IndyCar, or whatever. What do you look for in a 10-year-old, a 12-year-old? Is it all about speed in those karting days? No, absolutely not. Uh, because, of course, it's part of what we are looking for. but. When I'm going on a go-kart race, I'm following, let's say, the top 10 drivers or some drivers into the top 10 or top 15. And then I'm monitoring during an entire season what they are doing and whatever are the conditions, wet or dry or uh, if it's uh, super hot or cold. Or, and I'm more focused on how consistent uh, they are, how they are interacting uh, with their team, with their mechanic how uh, they will manage the race. And um, if I take, for example, Kimi Antonelli, who is one of our young drivers, the way at 11 years old he was able to read the race, uh, how he was defending, how he was attacking, he was not always the most uh, competitive one in Mini, um, but he was always there, always in the top five, uh, wet dry, uh, wind, whatever you want. He was always, always there. And he was extremely clever for such a young age. I have never seen uh, anyone as clever as uh, this uh, kid at this age. And has he continued to impress you as he's gone up the ladder into single seaters? Yes, definitely. Is a talented driver at the age of 10, at the age of 12, harder to spot than, say, a footballer? Yeah, I think it... Re well, the problem is you are depending also on the material you are, uh, you are having uh, in your hands. So um, when you are super talented, I think, in tennis or football, uh, you don't have uh, to rely on uh, too much on the, the material you are using. When in go-kart, actually, uh, it is the case. Even in mini, I mean, if you don't have the right package, it's difficult uh, to show up. But... When you have uh, someone really special, uh, you can still see he is uh, by the, the way he's defending, attacking, uh, even if he's not winning. Uh, if he starts P20 and end up P5, P6, uh, something like this, it's still something I will notice. I guess Ocon was a classic example of that. You say he was using old tyres because he couldn't afford new ones, and yet you could still spot him. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. He's a perfect example, actually because he was not often in a position to win and uh, he was still uh, ending up on the podium or uh, uh, sometime winning races. Where do you begin your search for the next Lewis Hamilton, George Russell? Does it have to be go-karts? Uh, do you feel that if you haven't been karting as a driver, you're missing out and it's too late? It's not necessarily too late, but 
it makes everything much easier when you start uh, as early as possible. And I really like uh, when we start a project in go-kart because you are building a trust uh, with a driver and with a family, which will be a way more difficult if you start uh, later on. There are so many kart drivers all over the world, almost in every country. How do you keep on top of who's coming through? Do you have talent scouts all over the world reporting into you? Yes, we have, a, I think, a strong network, but I'm not convinced uh, we are always picking the most talented one in the world. And I think uh, we are actually working on how we can make the sport more accessible because maybe the most talented kid is somewhere in South America and we don't know who is he because he is not able to afford uh, coming in Europe and racing uh, on the races we are uh, monitoring uh, and scouting uh, talents. So uh, there is a lot of uh, initiatives uh, actually to try to open the access to go-kart to a maximum of uh, young, talent, well, young drivers. Gwen, can you tell me a little bit more about that? So what, in South America, you're offering people a chance to come karting for the first time? Yes, we are uh, trying to support uh, through organizers, through uh, constructors, manufacturers. We are trying to help and support them, for example, to provide a go-kart to a young driver uh, or to a team somewhere in the world. And uh, we are pushing a lot and helping some organizers, ISN, to make the sport accessible. I think it is a key for young kids. Do you think you and Mercedes are the only people doing that? Because there are a lot of young driver programs now, aren't there? McLaren have just relaunched theirs, Alpine have one, Red Bull have one. I I think uh, everyone here in the paddock understood the importance of uh, having uh, talented drivers and how difficult it is to find uh, the new Lewis Hamilton or the new uh, uh, world champion. And um, we have all to make effort to support uh, young drivers. But we also have, I think, uh, to support all initiatives which can make the, the sport more accessible. Uh, a, a go-kart season, uh, international go-kart season is uh, uh, 250, 300, uh, thousand euros so you can understand that uh, how difficult it is to find the budget to be able to race uh, at this uh, level in go-kart so you've spotted a driver with potential i'm sure that driver has been spotted by other people as well what happens next for you to be able to look at them in more detail and potentially sign them up i think uh, we are not a lot or Maybe I am one of the only one <laughs> to go and to watch really at the early stage in mini between eight and 10 years old. And of course, it's always a, a bet or a risk when you sign a, a young driver at 11 years old because you don't know if he will develop or if he will, uh, let's say, tick all the boxes in the, the future. But until now, we haven't done too many mistakes and uh, what we have noticed on the early days uh, well their skills were we have improved the skills sorry and we have just correct what was uh, already uh, not uh, right and we are not a lot i think to do that such an early stage so you're looking for consistency but what else do you give them fitness tests do you give them cognitive tests well, when they are 11 years old, you know, they are still growing up. So, of course, uh, we are uh, uh, giving them uh, an initial introduction with a physical coach or a mental coach. Or, but it's very, very light because they are still growing up. And the most important at this age is uh, to enjoy what they are doing, to have fun and uh, to let them race and let express their natural uh, talent and skills. But more we go, we will add tools uh, around them. So when they are uh, 11 years old in go-kart, we let everything going very simple, you know. And the moment we switch them uh, to single-seater, which is a key moment in a a driver career, when you switch from go-kart to single-seater, then we start to add uh, 
a physical coach and then we have uh, someone with a young driver to guide him how to interact with the team how to uh, interact with your engineer how you you will uh, prepare your report etc what is important so everything so more we go and more we had uh, tools around the driver and of course you're helping them financially as well with the budget yes absolutely that's part of the support yeah and what about education because these guys and girls are spending so much time at racetracks and then of course they have to test midweek as well so they're missing a lot of school how do you help them with that that is a very good question and that's something we caring about so school uh, results are part of uh, what we are uh, monitoring and uh, it is uh, super important because when we sign a driver we take the responsibility of uh, not only a sport project but a life project and if you are not uh, reaching the top level or if you are not uh, becoming professional driver you still have to work so school is uh, super and education is super important and it's something we're uh, supporting a lot of course in go-kart um, they are spending, I don't know, 250 days uh, on track. It's uh, absolutely crazy. They are non-stop uh, driving from mid-January to mid-December. Uh, so we need to adapt uh, the school program to each uh, driver. And we are communicating with the family uh, to make sure that everything is uh, organized perfectly uh, with the school. So when you're doing 250 days driving, uh, I can see it's an incredible racing education. Do you allow them to do other sports as well, just to give them a more rounded view? Yes, definitely. And uh, we are, uh, well, it's, it's not easy when you are uh, committed into a uh, go kart and into racing, but uh, you can easily see that all the kids are playing football or playing tennis, or, and it has to be part of uh, their physical uh, education and development. So a lot of them are uh, actually uh, having another sport, uh, but more as a fun than a really uh, professional development or, a, or a approach. Can we develop the idea of what you're looking for in a young driver? What are the telltale signs that they are a future champion? Okay, they're quick and consistent, but if a young driver was sitting the other side of the table like I am to you now, what would impress you in terms of how they talk, how they act, how they interact with you? Yeah, most of the time, what I have uh, noticed with, uh, if I think about George or uh, Esteban or uh, Alex or uh, Kimi today, you can immediately feel at 12 years old, they already discuss with you as they, they are 20 years old. So the maturity they have at their age is uh, super impressive. And you can feel that you are already talking to someone apart, someone special, someone different. Uh, the way they are uh, quickly uh, thinking and answering to a question or even anticipating what you will uh, ask them, etc. They are... Uh, pretty impressive uh, for a 12 years old kid and what do you do about the parents because racing parents don't have a great reputation do they i get I, and i get it because many of them are investing huge sums of money and, and taking a great risk on their child's career but how do you keep the parents just one step away we try to do things uh, is more we try to involve them into a global project so they are part of uh, the decision process and we need to have them on board uh, with us so w when we are educating our uh, young drivers uh, to become professional we are also educating a little bit the parents environment and we are taking them on board and they, they must be part of the project you cannot make decision for a 12 15 years old kid uh, without having uh, the parents on board and fully aligned with what you are doing with your kids. So it is super important to make sure the parents are happy with the project you are presenting them and what you want to do with their kids. And if a parent has raced themselves, does that make the job for you easier or harder? Uh, harder, definitely harder because... Uh, 
of course, they always refer to their time and when they were doing this or that and uh, at their time. But and most of the time they haven't reached the level uh, their kids uh, are uh, reaching, or uh, they even not raced at the level their kid uh, their kids are racing. So it's not always easy, but you have to respect that and you have to take into consideration the passion for the sport they have and uh, uh, you have. To find a way to deal with uh, each of them, and uh, yeah, I think you're a great diplomat, Gwen. That's what I'm thinking. We have to <laughs> <laughs> want to win exclusive Formula One experiences and money can't buy prizes just by answering a few questions about Formula One. With Santander Lap Zero, you can be in with a chance of experiencing a Grand Prix like a VIP or getting your hands on signed F1 merchandise. And all you have to do to win is prove your knowledge by answering quiz questions on Formula One and sustainability. Here's how you play. First, go to SantanderLapZero.com or search Santander Lap Zero. Then after a simple sign up, you'll be ready to start answering questions. You'll be trying to get as many correct answers as you can against the clock. The more quizzes you do, the more answers you get right. And the faster you answer, the higher you'll be on the global leaderboard. A VIP Formula One experience, signed F1 merchandise and other great prizes are up for grabs. So prove your F1 knowledge and you could be a winner. You must be 18 or over to play and geographic restrictions apply. For more information, competition rules, full terms and conditions and to enter, go to SantanderLapZero.com. That's SantanderLapZero.com or search Santander Lap Zero. Now, look, there are only 20 seats in Formula One. What do you do when a young driver has climbed the ladder? You've done it together, but there's no seat available at the top echelon. What do you do next? Well, first, when we sign a driver, we feel the responsibility of delivering a job. It's a life project for these kids. And I feel the responsibility of... uh, giving everything I can to help them to perform and to guide them and to bring them to the top. It means that you have also to anticipate what will be the market in two years, in three years, in four years. And do we have, if I sign this driver, is there a a slot uh, in four years time in Formula One, a possible slot? Uh, Do I have a real chance to bring him to Formula One? Sometime you have a fantastic uh, driver winning in F2, uh, and we have seen that uh, recently, and there is no opportunity in F1. So uh, we try to always uh, anticipate that situation first, and then we have always uh, some options uh, on our uh, list. Uh, Of course, uh, reserve, test driver, simulator, but uh, for a young driver, I think important is also to to have a possibility uh, in uh, uh, in another series like endurance or uh, in Japan or uh, in IndyCar, uh, you need to have uh, different uh, options uh, open. I was going to ask, how important is it that a 20-year-old keeps racing? How long can you keep them on the sidelines? Well, first, I think if we have an exceptional talent, you have always uh, a possibility in Formula One. I don't think the last 15 years we missed someone exceptional. I think all the exceptional drivers are actually in Formula 1. So if uh, you end up in a situation where you have to wait a little bit, you must find them uh, track time because uh, let's say it's part of the preparation and you know that, okay, we have to wait maybe one year but next year it will be in. So you, you have to maintain the training, you have to maintain the racing spirit, you have to maintain everything uh, before to find a solution in Formula One. But it cannot be more than a year, I think. So let's take Oscar Piastri as an example. I know he's not one of your drivers, but he sat out last year and did some miles in a two-year-old car. And you think that is okay for a year, but had a race seat not become available this year, you, if you were managing him, would have found something for him to race elsewhere. Yeah, definitely. 
definitely, because otherwise you are losing too much uh, by waiting. And I'm interested that if you have a real talent, you say they normally find their way, as in, even if on paper the seats all look full in Formula One, if you've got the next Lewis or Max, you'll be able to muscle your way in somehow. Is that how it works? Yeah, I, I, and probably because if you are sure of it, uh, you will know it uh, earlier enough to anticipate and to make sure that, in okay, in two years' time, uh, uh, it will be there. So what are the possibilities? And uh, can we already find uh, an agreement with uh, a team uh, to put him in Formula One? So that's what we... We, we are trying to do. With George, for example, I mean, when we signed him uh, in 2016, he was in Formula 3. And after, uh, let's say, the first year of uh, training, it was not obvious yet. But when he won uh, GP3, the target was to go in Formula 2. And from there, I knew that I had to find uh, a possibility in Formula 1. What will be the situation in two years? And if George win F2, where uh, I can put him in Formula One and we have anticipated all that. How tough is it for a rookie coming into Formula One now? Because there's very little testing. There's huge amount of pressure. Is it much harder for young guys coming in now than it was, say, 15 years ago? It is more difficult because you have less testing and track time. But on the other hand, I think we are also preparing uh, young drivers more than it was uh, 15 years ago. Uh, they are spending a lot of time in the factory, they are interacting with our uh, group of engineers, they are doing a lot of simulator, so they know all the procedures, they know the teams, they know they are used to have a technical uh, discussion with our guys, etc., etc. So yes, the track time is less than it was before, so it makes it a little bit more difficult uh, when you you have to drive. But in terms of preparation, I think we are preparing them uh, way more than it was a few years ago. Now, can we talk about women and Formula One? It's a question that I often get, and I'm sure you do as well, but why are there no female drivers in Formula One? What's your take on that? Uh, my personal view is uh, it's mathematic. When you have 100 uh, boys starting in go-kart, you have one girl. So uh, out of this uh, 100 boys, uh, maybe one will make it to Formula One. So if you have just one girl starting uh, in the same time, the chance is zero to make it. So the key right now is to uh, attract uh, much more girls uh, in go-kart than what we, we have now. Um, at Mercedes, uh, we are uh, lucky to have uh, one uh, young, talented uh, girl called Luna Fluxa. She's racing in uh, go-karts, actually, in junior. And she won in uh, the European Mini Yame Championship two years ago uh, in front of uh, 90 uh, angry boys. <laughs> and it took me a year and months to to find a girl uh, into our program. So we need to have more girls racing. We need to attract more girls. And there is also a lot of uh, initiatives at the moment to promote girls in motorsport, but also to attract much more girls in go-karts. That is a key. How do we do that? How do we make the sport more attractive for girls? Well, first, I think we have to make it more accessible in general. So uh, the financial cost is... Uh, a key and I think all the initiatives uh, made by Formula One with the F1 Academy to attract girls into our sport are uh, helping and you are developing passions uh, also Netflix etc I mean Formula One is attracting uh, more and more girls you know by doing that you have we can see that there is more girls coming in go-kart but we need more and more and more so we need a uh, uh, as much as uh, girls than boys. And that's the only uh, way I think we can find a talented girl and bring her to Formula One. I mean, recent research by the FIA and Formula One suggests that 40% of the audience now watching Formula One is female. So do you think over time that will start to be reflected in at the grassroots of driving? 
Yes, I think we are just at the beginning of the process and uh, the impact uh, will be seen in three, four, five years. I think you will see uh, much more girls coming in uh, the international go-kart in the coming years. We just start to see in Mini, for example, the first year that there is a little bit more girls uh, than uh, five, six years ago. So we start to notice the impact, but we need to keep pushing. We need to keep pushing. Luna is clearly very talented. You've said, you know, how successful she's been already. Is her approach at the age of 12 any different to the approach of a 12-year-old boy? Absolutely not. She's uh, so, so determined, the same as George was. Uh, She's uh, pushing and she's uh, a little uh, monster when she's uh, wearing uh, her uh, helmet and she wants just to win and to... And when you talk to her, she doesn't want to be considered as a girl. She wants to be considered as a driver. And uh, she's such a character. And uh, yes, she's uh, definitely a part and special as well. How important are role models for these young drivers in terms of for, for, uh, for Luna? How important is someone like Susie Wolf? Equally for a, a young boy, how much do they look up to George, to Lewis, to... Esteban. Well, there are examples, uh, uh, good examples to follow. And uh, George is actually helping me a lot uh, with young drivers because uh, he's an example for uh, all of them. Of course, uh, we have uh, the privilege to have Lewis into our team who is seven times uh, world champion. So he, he was already an example for George to follow. And uh, I hope uh, in the future, George will be also an example for uh, the young drivers uh, coming by being world champion. It's really interesting that you say Lewis was an example for George to follow, because it, if you look at the history books, it does work like that. When Michael Schumacher started winning uh, in the 90s, there was then a surge in the number of German drivers making it to Formula One. And I think 10, 15 years ago, we had as many as six at one time. Equally, there's now a, a surge in interest from young British drivers because of everyone wanting to be like Lewis, I guess. What do you do in the markets where there isn't a role model in the US, for example, or China? Or how do we get more people involved in karting in those countries? Yeah, that is uh, all the discussion we are having right now with the FIA and with uh, some uh, organizers. And that's uh, what I was saying earlier in our discussion, uh, Tom. It's uh, how we we make the sport more accessible and uh, how we help people to be in a position to afford uh, a go-kart season. And uh, I think we start now to have uh, more and more US kids, for example, coming in Europe, but it's not easy because we are talking about school. So how you do when you are a young American kid and you have to live in Italy at 12 years old uh, to race uh, in Europe, to, it's super difficult. So we, we are trying to answer all that question and to make uh, everything we can to make sure we are attracting the most talented kids around the world. But how do you encourage a young American driver to want to be the next Lewis Hamilton rather than the next Jeff Gordon in NASCAR, for example? Yeah, well, yes, I think uh, now we have uh, three Grand Prix uh, in the US and when you see the popularity and how many uh, spectators we are uh, having into those events and how many kids uh, are waiting at the entrance and uh, and who knows, uh, Lewis knows George, knows all the drivers, I think they now all want to race in go-kart and they all... Uh, uh, want to become the next uh, world champion in Formula 1 or the next uh, F1 driver and uh, I think the, 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 the popularity F1 is having again now uh, is helping to attract uh, young talents uh, in go-kart. It's so great to talk about all these young talents. How interested is Toto Wolf in what's going on on the young driver program and how much does he ask you about the 10-year-olds, the 12-year-olds coming through? Well, he's very, very, very uh, into it. <laughs> and uh, he Actually, his son he, has just started racing, yeah, I think, hasn't he? he yeah, he starts go-kart, yeah. And, but Toto, you know, uh, started, uh, he was a racing driver. Uh, he was racing himself. Then he, he was managing uh, young talents in the past. I think that's how he started really in uh, motorsport, by helping uh, young drivers. I remember guys, uh, Alex Prema, 
or uh, Lewis's yeah. teammate in GP2. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, he was uh, also uh, helping few other drivers. Uh, I know, and he has a huge passion for the sport and for the drivers, and he's following everything. Sometimes I'm on a go kart race, and he's texting me or calling me to know uh, what's going on and why uh, Alex didn't win the heat and uh, what happened, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So he, we are interacting a lot, and he's uh, super, uh, super uh, uh, involved into the young driver program, which is cool. I'm fascinated to know a little bit about your background now. How did you come to manage young drivers? Well, uh, I did nine years uh, go-kart. Well, first... So you wanted to be a racing driver as well? Yeah, well, my dad uh, brought me into, uh, into motorsport and uh, it started when I was a super young kid. We were watching Formula One Grand Prix on TV and it was family event uh, at that time. Every Sunday uh, Grand Prix were, was a, a family moment and uh, then I first time I went on the Formula One Grand Prix I was four years old it was Dijon uh, 1979 the famous the uh, famous Gilles Villeneuve yeah, Rene which I, yeah which I absolutely don't remember on track <laughs> the only thing I remember is uh, I met Jack Lafitte uh, and he came to me and he scratched my head and say something like hey buddy what are you doing and that I still remember, it's funny. And a few years later, I started in go-kart and I did nine years go-kart and I did a few years in rally. But I understood quickly that if I was staying behind the steering wheel, I would never make one penny in motorsport. <laughs> so I, uh, I had to do my army time and then I started to work. And I met by, I stay uh, with a huge passion for motorsport and I did uh, some uh, studies in uh, sport, uh, law and economy, a uh, master to uh, sport, law and economy. And um, I met almost by accident the first driver I uh, worked with. His name was is Guillaume Moreau and uh, he was racing in Formula Renault at that time. And he was looking for some uh, help to find partners and to help him with uh, more or less everything. And that's uh, how everything started in 2004. And then how do you grow a business like that? The first uh, year was, uh, I mean, we had zero money and we were, uh, everything was about the racing and uh, each penny we were finding was uh, going into the racing program. So, but it was a time where uh, I met uh, Fred Vasser. He was running his Formula 3 team, uh, ASM at that time. Uh, I met Eric Boulier, I met Toto Wolf, uh, and all these guys uh, end up in Formula One. And I was, I was just uh, probably at the right place at the right time. And I have developed this network with them, and we knew each other. And I think they, they liked the way I was uh, helping uh, my driver. And when the opportunity came. It was with Eric Boulier. Uh, he, he arrived at uh, Renault F1 and he had this uh, young driver program in place and he called me to ask me what I was thinking about and how we could uh, develop things together. And I joined uh, the Enstone uh, team in 2010. So which drivers were there in 2010? That was Romain Grosjean? Uh, yeah. That was uh, Roman Grosjean, Jérôme D'Ambrosio. Uh, How funny. And you're working yeah. with Jérôme again <laughs> yeah, now. Absolutely. And are you staying in touch with Roman as he yes, I'm actually, racing uh, an IndyCar? Yes, yeah, I'm actually uh, uh, helping him as a friend to uh, deal with his contract and uh, advise uh, for uh, IndyCar. And uh, it's nice to see him enjoying again, you know, racing and fighting for Paul and being angry because he missed... Uh, the pole position for uh, one tenth or whatever, and he's again, you know, uh, on top of uh, his game. So it's uh, really nice to see him. How does your own experience of driving help with your interactions with the young guys and girls? Zero, because uh, I was uh, never racing at the level my uh, drivers are uh, racing. So it doesn't help me, and I'm not acting as a driver coach, and I'm never going to tell them uh, how to drive. 
uh, it would be uh, not appropriate. Uh, but it's more about how to understand the motorsport world and what is important, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I don't think that really helped me because I was first about maybe for go kart, but I, I was more doing rally. So and it's different world. It's like rugby and football. You have a ball, you have a playground, but it's two different sports. So it never helped me. Just the same mentality, being able to understand. You know what oversteer feels like. You know what understeer feels like. Yeah, but they are working with engineers and uh, they are uh, super talented. So it would be not appropriate uh, coming from me who has never achieved anything. <laughs> I mean, I have done it as a complete amateur and uh, here we're in a professional world. So it's yeah, two different stuff. Well, look, Gwen, it's been wonderful to talk to you. Let's end it just by talking about the current crew on the the Mercedes Young Driver program. You've got seven drivers. For the listeners, who do they want to watch out for? Uh, well, <laughs> we, we have Frederick Vesti, who is uh, racing in Formula 2. We have uh, Paul Aron in Formula 3. We have Andrea Kimi Antonelli uh, racing in uh, Formula Regional, who is actually the first one we have uh, signed in go-kart uh, into the Mercedes program. Uh, we have Alex Powell, uh, the Jamaican rocket, <laughs> and uh, who is uh, doing amazing actually in go kart. Uh, we have uh, Yuan Pukui, a Chinese driver, uh, probably the most talented uh, Chinese at the moment, uh, kid coming from China, yeah, also in go kart. And uh, we have uh, Luna Fluxa. And uh, we have Kenzo Krigi, a young uh, British uh, kid also racing in the UK in go kart. And the goal with all of those people is Formula One? I wish, <laughs> and it would be a, a dream, but we have to be realistic. My target is to make them all professional. That would be already uh, something uh, good, and uh, I wish few of them will reach uh, Formula One. Gwen, best of luck with them. Thank you very much for your time. It's been great to chat. Thanks to you, Tom. Wasn't that a fascinating insight into how the future stars of Formula One are found? I'll share my thoughts on that a little bit later. But first, here's Mercedes team principal Toto Wolff discussing the team's young driver program. Mercedes always um, supported um, young driver when you look back in the glory days of Schumacher and uh, Wendlinger, Kreuzpoint, and friends. And these names will not ring a lot, will not say a lot to new fans, but that was a junior program where Schumacher is a good example. Eventually, he ended up in, in Formula One, very successful. He drove our sports cars. And since then, we, we tried to keep it up. And over the many years, we've always had junior drivers that eventually made it um, into professional motor racers. And the latest examples are George and Valtteri and Esteban Ocon. And therefore, we are trying to home grow a young talent and whilst not always racing for us at the end we are proud to have them how often do drivers of formula one caliber come along i for me it's in, in a way cyclical we, we see spells where you suddenly have a handful that end up in formula one and then for many years there's nothing and then uh, every 10 year you have a you have a great one that's growing uh, into formula one that's kind of the um, cycle that i have think i have uh, seen i think it's when Karting is competitive uh, within a certain age group, they push each other. And when you look at Leclerc and Gasly or Korn, they have competed against each other on national level and then add to the equation Lando Norris, Max Verstappen, um, Albon, Leclerc and George Russell. It's pretty much more than 50% of the grid and they are all within two years of age. And that was a very strong generation. And then in between you see uh, less competitive and then they come in bundles again in a way. Toto, what do you look for in a young driver? Speed. Speed, speed, speed. And uh, that means how quickly can you actually uh, pull out of a, a lap? How adaptable are you? Um, but everything you can learn, but you haven't had the talent and the nurture that is needed to have all that, you, you're you going to fail uh, to go to the very top echelon of Formula One. And uh, obviously character uh, and personality are important, but if the parents have those values and transcend them to the to the children, they stay humble whilst hungry. 
I think we can form them too and pretty much take over when they are teenagers together with the parents. And I think that combination is crucial for me. How obvious is this speed you're talking about when, you, when you're looking at a, a 10-year-old, an 8-year-old? I think Gwen and his team, they've been around for a long time and you can see that. There is kids that already in the very junior classes at the age of 10, you can see how they handle the cart, um, how they take the pressure. You can see talent shining through. And if you add the nurture to that, they can be, they can be really competitive. Do the good drivers always make it to Formula One? No, I think uh, Michael Schumacher said it once, um, there might be a bus driver out there that is more talented and quicker than he would have been. And I think um, take the population of uh, you know Montreal, where we are at the moment, I guess there's a thousand people that would make pretty good racing drivers, but they just had never, the, never had the opportunity. Can you think of someone who didn't make it to F1 who deserved to be there? Can you give us a name? No, I can. I have seen, and I don't want to give you names because I think it would be unfair. I've seen uh, young drivers with tremendous talent that have failed because they either didn't have the education, uh, nor the right role models in parents, or simply lacked uh, intellect or social intelligence. They just failed. They, they thought it is not important. It's just important to have speed, and eventually, they didn't build the networks that were needed, and they didn't act in the way that was you know, that brought them the right support. But it's interesting. So it's not just speed, speed, speed. Speed is the fundamental basis. But what I'm saying is there are people that had speed but failed eventually because of the lack of personality, integrity, honesty, uh, loyalty. But it doesn't go without speed. The nice guy with all this uh, great character traits which would make him um, a, a good friend, a successful entrepreneur, manager, can't make it if he hasn't got the talent. Have you got any regrets, any future champions that you could have signed but didn't? I never have regrets because everything happens for a reason. Um, and uh, sometimes there were great drivers coming along and we didn't have s space for them. And at other times, uh, they just needed to do a, take a different trajectory. But I think what we have today with, uh, with our drivers, and when I, look at the, when I look at the junior categories, I'm, I'm really happy. I, I'm, I love seeing Kimi uh, grow through the ranks and, and Alex Powell. I enjoy seeing uh, Luna's success. And there's a few others that, that are part of our of our junior program that um, can be a generation that can be eventually very successful in Formula One. It's interesting to hear you talking about, you know, you love seeing these guys and girls coming through. How involved are you personally in their progression? So Gwen runs the program with Stefan and, and he's in their team there at most of the kart races. They nurture them. Uh, when you look at Gwen, Gwen was fundamental for Esteban's development and very closely involved to George Russell's career as well at a certain stage. And uh, we talk, they present to me where they think uh, a driver can make it in the academy. We talk about the business models, how much money is needed, if, if any, and uh, they place them in the right teams. And I'm just giving, you know, just giving my final thumbs up or thumbs down but i empower gwen uh, very much to take these decisions could you have bought max no i don't want to talk about buying max first of all because that was the wrong terminology no they just max was was very good in karting uh was good in f3 and it was clear that there's a big one that's growing and we talked to them in the initial phases uh, and was was a nice discussion with uh, with yours and uh, with Max involved as well but it was clear that we couldn't give him a seat because we had Nico and we had Lewis and we offered the support in F2 but uh, since uh, Red Bull was able to offer them the Alfa Tauri seat or Toro Rosso back in the day um, it got it got Max into into the seat. Had you known when you were having those discussions that Nico Rosberg was going to retire at the end of 2016, do you think Max might have made a different decision? Well, maybe, but you know, if and when, if I would know where the stock market is next year, I would decide to invest in it or not. So, yeah, we would be very happy and rich people if we would know what happens in 12 months on. Final topic is just female drivers. Research by the FIA and Formula One has revealed that 40% of Formula One's audience is female. When will that be reflected in the number of girls entering karting? When you look at the grid today in, in karting of 4,000 boys, you will probably have 20 girls. And it's just not a meaningful number. And I think what F1 has launched, managed by 
Susi, the F1 Academy has exactly that target to at the very grassroots in karting and then through um, Formula One Academy um, racing cars to build the next generation of um, female drivers, but not, let's say, quota girls or just grid fillers, but really find um, a woman that can race in Formula One in a competitive car successfully. That's the aim. And Susie have set, has set herself those targets that within the next few years uh, to identify that, that girl or that woman and uh, you know, hopefully in five years and, or a bit more to have a, a girl or more on merit in Formula One uh, racing for podiums or victories. Can we talk about Luna Fluxer, who's on your program? Do you look at her and see her in any way different to the boys of the same age karting? Of course, I look uh, in, a, in a different way. Luna is uh, uh, the first girl who is really capable of racing in the top field of her uh, karting class and uh, has the talent and the background to become very successful as a, as a racing driver. Having said that, uh, if she would a boy, she would be a boy at that stage. You would expect her to win, and win um, championships. But I think we need to take it from there and say she has all the ingredients to be successful. Her parents have done a good job, and now it's up to us to continue to nurture her, teach her, and that's Gwen and Stefano are doing all of that, and eventually make her ready uh, for Formula cars. Thanks for your time, Toto and Gwen. And I hope you at home enjoyed these conversations because the job that Mercedes do is vital to the continued development of tomorrow's F1 stars. And I feel that we now understand a little more about how the system works. I'm excited to see which Mercedes young stars make it to F1, but there's a real sense of responsibility from Gwen and his team. To give their seven young pups careers as professional racing drivers is job number one. Then, if the stars align and they make it to F1, that's the icing on the cake. And as Gwen says, all the exceptional drivers have made it to F1. Good luck with the programme, Gwen, and I'll see you at a racetrack again soon. So what did you make of what Gwen and Toto had to say? Are you someone who might have made it had you had their backing? Let me know your thoughts about everything we've discussed on the show and I'll read out some of your comments at the end of next week's episode. Please contact me via all the usual means. I'm at Tom Clarkson F1 on Twitter or you can use the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid. Which brings me on to what you sent in about last week's guest Nico Hulkenberg. I thought Nico was in cracking form, and so did you, judging by your comments. Let's start with this from KJS. Hi, Tom. I really enjoyed the podcast with Nico Hulkenberg. My then 13-year-old son and I had the honour of meeting Nico in Sydney during his A1GP days. And he was so generous with his time and so down to earth. He's a great guy, and I hope he stays in Formula One for many years to come. Well, thanks for the note. That's a lovely story. Nico is definitely one of the drivers who makes time for people, and even more since he came back to Formula One full time with Haas. And what about this from Nav F1? Nico might genuinely be one of the best drivers never to have experienced a top seat. It would have been nice to see him at Red Bull for a season. Now there's a thought, Nav. Interestingly, Nico is quite matey with Max Verstappen. He often flies to races in Max's plane, but unfortunately, I'm not sure there's any more to it than that. Convenience. And finally, what about this from Joseph Hines? I really want Haas to make a step forward. Nico has been a great acquisition and I can't wait to see their B-Spec car in Austin in October. They truly need something positive out of this season. Well, wouldn't it be great if Haas were able to challenge for points regularly in the last five races of 2023? Watch this space. Look, we're going to leave it there for messages this week, but thank you to everyone who wrote in about the Hulk. We read everything and we love what you have to say. And thanks very much for listening. I'll be back next week with another great guest who happens to be one of the most ferociously competitive people I've ever met. F1 Beyond the Grid is produced by Formula One and Audio Boom Studios. Until next time, keep it flat out.